This is for Keeps, a podcast about collections and connections. I'm David Peterkovsky. It's a sad story that's all too familiar, yet no less heartbreaking, thanks in large part to its countless retellings in best selling books, blockbuster films, and in our culture as a whole. In the early morning hours of April 15, 1912, the RMS Titanic sank in the North Atlantic Ocean, four days after leaving Southampton, England, for New York City, brought down by an iceberg in its path. Out of 2,200 or so people on the ship, more than 1,500 perished in the sinking of the Titanic, a ship that had been hailed before its maiden and only voyage as the world's largest ocean liner, and one that offered luxurious accommodations for its first-class passengers. But not everyone on board the Titanic was a first-class traveler. Her passengers ranged from millionaires such as John Jacob Astor and Benjamin Guggenheim to poor immigrants, leaving places such as Armenia, Ireland, Italy, and Russia to seek a new life in America. As one of the deadliest peacetime maritime disasters in history, the Titanic's demise and the fact that some passengers survived, while many didn't, continue to captivate people more than a century after the tragedy. Over the years, amateur and professional historians alike have had no shortage of ways to learn about the ship and its sad fate, the disaster having inspired an endless array of books, television programs, and perhaps most notably movies, including the 1958 film A Night to Remember, and of course the 1997 king of the box office, Titanic. Actually, the third highest grossing film in Hollywood history at over $2.2 billion earned. As for enthusiasts who are also collectors, they'd probably need a Titanic-sized bank account if they wanted to collect anything that was found in the ship's wreckage which American oceanographer Bob Ballard discovered back in 1985. But there are plenty of other Titanic-related collectibles in the world, and one notable Titanic collector is Mark Zaid. Mark is a prominent national security attorney in the Washington, D.C. area, and when he's not representing folks like high-profile national security whistleblowers, he's pursuing his obsession with all things Titanic, as he's done for most of his life, and he's got the collection to show for it. Along with a sizable library of books chronicling the disaster, he's working on collecting as many Titanic-related postcards from before and after the ship's sinking that he can find. And as a collector of historical documents, Mark has tracked down original copies of British and American governmental reports that looked into the disaster. Perhaps most impressive, however, are the medals he's obtained that were awarded to crew members from the RMS Carpathia for rescuing Titanic survivors. And he's got a couple of telegrams, or Marconigrams, that were transmitted between the Titanic and her sister ship, the RMS Olympic, as well as the Carpathia, just after the fateful collision. And then, there's the story of a coin Mark bought in an auction. A coin that was reportedly found in the pocket of a Titanic passenger who didn't survive. More on that later. Mark's collecting instinct kicked in at an early age and has stayed with him from elementary school all the way through his legal career. I started when I was single digits. I can't tell you why, because it did not stem from anyone in my family, but I got into coins and stamps and comic books, which I guess would be the staple of being a young kid. And this was back in the early uh, and mid-1970s, baseball cards as well. I, I still have some elementary school uh, documentation where I had a stamp club in second grade and advertising for members. And I used to sell comic books in sixth grade, with, bring them in with my backpack and sell them during, I guess, lunch period or rest period or something like that. Uh, and, and had a part-time comic book business my senior year of high school, which I then continue to have for the last 20 years, even as a practicing lawyer. Uh, and I use my law practice actually to work in a lot of the hobby areas that I collect in. Somehow I get tied into as a legal result. Oh, 
How does that work? So I usually because I get to know people who are other fellow collectors, especially at the high end or the businesses, the auction houses. And if there's a legal need, uh, especially because I deal with the U.S. government, so I represent quite a number of auction houses who at times have issues with the U.S. government, typically because they're either auctioning something, rarely that it's stolen, but it happens, not by my clients, but by someone down the path line of the owners, uh, or it's an item that the government thinks belongs to them, like a, a space item where there is a lot of issues as to who owns the property that astronauts took home back in the 1960s and gave away as gifts, or individuals at times who get defrauded in transactions. So I try and step in. It's also a good way for me as a very active national security lawyer to have some sort of downtime where I'm dealing with my hobbies and my collectibles, but yet I'm still functioning as a lawyer. So it's actually kind of relaxing for me. <laughs> so let's talk about when you first became aware of the Titanic. Do you recall your first memory of hearing about it? So it would have been in the mid, by the mid seventies. I had this strange obsession with disasters and famous events that involved either assassinations or, or tragedy. I have no idea why. All presidential assassinations, but predominantly Lincoln and Kennedy, JFK. Uh, and then, you know, Garfield, McKinley, RFK, Huey Long, um, missing persons, the Bermuda Triangle, Amelia Earhart, I was just fascinated by all of this. But the Titanic, the Lusitania, the Morro Castle, the Andrea Doria, the USS Cyclops going missing in in uh, the Bermuda Triangle uh, in World War One. all of these cases just fascinated me. Uh, and I remember reading books in the mid-70s as a little kid, young kid, six, seven, eight years old, about the Titanic. In fact, I had a scrapbook. I still have it of anything Titanic from the newspaper I would collect and put in the scrapbook. So there were all these efforts in the late 70s, early 80s by this one guy, Jack Grimm, I remember, this millionaire when millionaire meant something at the time, when he was searching for the Titanic. And I've got all these articles about it. Of course, it wasn't discovered for real until 1985 by Bob Ballard and Woods Hole and the U.S. Navy. Quite possibly with that scrapbook in hand. Mark experienced a turning point in his interest in all things Titanic when he was in ninth grade. My health teacher said he was someone who was also a fan of the ship and its history. And he suggested and told me about the Titanic Historical Society and that I should join. Uh, and so I joined in, in 1981. The organization's still around. It was founded in 1963 by a small group of Titanic enthusiasts. And so 18 years later, I became a member as a 14-year-old. <laughs> wow. You knew from an early age what you liked. Yeah, it's just, I, I wish, you know, you can't really explain why. I mean, you know, it's hard not to be fascinated by the Titanic. By any means, I'm not the first one, even as a young kid. You know, there were movies. There were movies in the 40s and 50s. And then there was Raise the Titanic in 1980 by Clive Cussler, based on his book book from 1975, I think it was, which is a phenomenal book. Uh, the movie's not so good. But, you know, I think I read that book at the time, and, and that also spurred me on to have the interest in the ship. So getting back to when you were young, I mean, what were some of the first items you collected? And I imagine being young sort of was hampering your ability to collect a lot of things. Yeah, of course, not not much you can do other than do the scrapbook that I mentioned and just kind of collect paper. And the THS, Titanic Historical Society, which I have not been a member since the 90s, I ended up helping found the Titanic International Society, of which I was a board member of for a few years in the 90s. And the organization, that one is still around as well, sort of a competing organization, although it has a broader scope of all ships, not just the Titanic. But the Titanic Historical Society reprinted a lot of the original publications of either brochures, pamphlets, postcards, even some books, so that in the early 80s, 81, 82, 83, my sort of junior high, high school years, I was buying reproductions and I remember filling out the order form 
in the back of the magazine to obtain. I still have all these items. In fact, uh, now I buy the original items, <laughs> not the reproduction. But that's, of course, you know what I could afford with my paper route basically for Newsday on Long Island, which is the paper uh, for most of Long Island and New York City area. Uh huh. So let's dive into your collection that you've gained post paper route. Um, off the top of your head, what would you say are some of the standout items? I'd say the standout items are the Carpathia medals. In the aftermath of being rescued by the RMS Carpathia, 705 survivors, Molly Brown, a very wealthy woman from Colorado uh, who was uh, and became a Broadway show, a movie, uh, the unsinkable Molly Brown. And she had made for the crew of the Carpathia medals commemorating them and thanking them for the rescue of the officers, crew and passengers from the ship. So there were a little bit more than 300 or so made the regular crew of the Carpathia got bronze medals. It commemorates, you know, what they did. And on the back, it's etched in the description of, of the event. The lower ranking officers got silver medals. I want to say there was about a dozen, eight, somewhere between half a dozen to a dozen. I'm not sure. I, I think we know the numbers. I just don't know it off the top of my head. And then the captain, and I think the first officer and May is second, maybe third, the key officers, they got gold medals. At least one gold medal has been sold. It went for something like $55,000 like 20 or so years ago. Uh, it'd be a lot more now, clearly. And I have picked up one of the silver and two or three of the bronze over time. They don't come up very often at all. Uh, you know, either they've obviously been lost to history or they are an incredible keepsake within the family of the crew members of the Carpathia and have no doubt been handed down or lost over the years. So very, very rarely do they ever come up. And I remember reading about them as a kid, and that was kind of the holy grail that I was looking for to find. And I still try and buy them whenever I can find them. Also among Mark's most prized Titanic collectibles are actual messages transmitted shortly after the time of the accident via the Marconi Company's wireless telegraph system, including one sent by the Titanic's sister ship to the Titanic. I have some Marconigrams, which was a very new form of communication. And this was how, you know, through, you know, dot, 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 dash, 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 the SOS and stuff. This was how the ships would communicate. There would be a transmittal version, and then there would be a received version. And I have a copy of a Marconi gram, uh, so there would be two. It was a message between the Titanic and her sister ship, the Olympic, which was 500 miles away at the time. And the Titanic's wireless continued to work for, I, I'm going to probably be off, let's say an hour and a half before... She sank. She got, she hit the iceberg around 1130 in, at night, sank at 220 in the morning. So for a good period of that time, she was trying to send wireless signals, trying to reach other ships. And she did reach the Olympic fairly early, I think within about 15 minutes of hitting the iceberg. And they were trying to figure out whether or not the Olympic could come and reach her. And so the Olympic told the Titanic to sail south to a specific designation, a specific coordinate, latitude, longitude, where they could meet up. So obviously the recipient version or copy on the Titanic went down with the ship, but this was the one that the Olympic sent to the Titanic. And then I have two Marconi grams between the Olympic and the Carpathia the next day when the Olympic was still trying to figure out, should she come to the area? The Titanic had since sank and the Carpathia basically told the Olympic no, I think we picked up everybody. There doesn't seem to be anybody else. And we don't want you to come to the scene because for those who are Titanic enthusiasts, uh, they will know that the Olympic and the Titanic looked virtually identical. I mean, you have to know specifically what you're looking for to know that one of the decks has one level enclosed where the other does not. But at first glance, you would think it's the same ship. And the Carpathia and the Olympic were concerned if the Olympics showed up, it would freak everybody out of the survivors that, you know, here's this ghost ship. So these are the Marconi grams received by 
received by or sent by the Olympic uh, in the 24 hours from when the Titanic hits. So pretty rare and cool items from a historical standpoint. Very much so. And I would imagine these are not eBay finds. I mean, how are you tracking these things down? No, these I actually what I bought a metal once, I think, on eBay. You, you have to be careful, certainly now, because the Titanic Historical Society did make reproductions of the metals. So anyone listening, if you're looking to buy one, be really, really careful that you're not buying a reproduction copy, because sometimes they're hard to tell. But usually for something like this, uh, I'm buying them at through well-known auction houses, either other collectors or through auctions that that I know and trust so that I I know that these items are going to be real. And then there's Mark's fascination with Titanic-related postcards. He's got a few hundred in his collection, and now he's working on a book about them. So I've been a big postcard enthusiast since I was younger, and there is no definitive listing or inventory of postcards relating to the Titanic disaster. There are at least three books that I know of, and I'm actually working on one now to document far more than what these other books have disclosed or documented over the years. Uh, I probably have at least something like 300 Titanic-related postcards, including a few that are reproductions. I don't usually buy modern reproductions uh, other than what I bought 40 years ago as a kid. Uh, so I'm buying vintage cards from, you know, 1911 to not long after the ship went down where they were making it. And what makes it difficult at times is a lot of postcards were homemade So there only may be one or several of those or foreign cards. We see a lot of, not I want to say a lot, we see a number of French versions of some of the cards. Uh, I see those more often than anywhere else, but there are German versions that I have seen. I think I've seen some ones from like Serbia uh, as well. And, you know, those usually will come up in an auction uh, as well. I have bought on eBay and this is where, again, you've got to be really, really careful because I bought a card a bunch of years ago. It sure looked real, but when I got it, I figured out it was a complete reproduction because it, it had a vintage stamp on it with a vintage message and postmark, but it was completely brand new. So, right, you couldn't touch the stamp because it was an image of a stamp. I don't know to this day if the seller knew it was a fake item. Maybe they didn't check. Uh, and it only cost me like $50, so I really didn't. It wasn't worth my time to deal with, but that was a real lesson learned. So I, again, typically buy either through auction houses or fellow collectors, but there's not that many cards of the Titanic pre-sinking for obvious reasons, right? She had only sailed four days earlier before she hit the iceberg, and most of them were kind of promotional between the Titanic and the Olympic just to uh, encourage transatlantic crossings on it. Uh, the vast, vast majority of the cards are of post-sinking and then of the very, very many memorials that have been created in in the United Kingdom and in the United States and New York City, there's some, or related events like crew members arriving in New York City to testify before Congress, or cards about Molly Brown, or uh, anything dealing with the grave sites up in Halifax, Canada, Nova Scotia, where many of the victims were buried, particularly if they didn't know who they were. Uh, They just put them in mass graves, hundreds and hundreds of victims. And those are all on postcards. So I know that historical documents are another collecting interest of yours. And when it comes to the Titanic, you've got governmental reports from the U.S. and British governments. How do you come across those? What's the story behind them? Yeah, again, these are rarely found. You know, look, you can go to an antiquarian bookstore and you can find books on the Titanic. And I collect any book I can find. There are some that are, especially in the wake of the disaster, there were several books done, mass produced. Those are very easy to find. And, you know, they'll go, depending on condition, $25 to $200. And and they're pretty cool. They were a series. They did this for the Lusitania. They did this for the San Francisco earthquake. McKinley's assassination, 1901. These books were like churned out the beginning of the 20th century really, really quickly. A lot of the books were very limited print. uh, And finding those are really difficult. You rarely find them. I have found in used bookstores. It's got to be an auction. 
Now, the publications, the British Board of Trade did investigations, the U.S. Congress did investigations, and you can find some of these reports generally, again, in auctions. I just literally found, so this is a good timing for doing this podcast, I literally just bought the complete set of U.S. Senate investigative hearings into the Titanic. I think it's all been reprinted, so you can buy them in a modern reprint. Uh, I had that, and I had one original volume. I actually didn't even realize that there were 12 volumes that went along with it, and I just found all 12 of them that I bought in auction, and I was really hoping, I think they were estimated at like $1,000, I was really hoping nobody else is going to realize what I just found here. Well, clearly there was at least one other person who realized what this was. And we got into a massive bidding war and it went for a lot more money than I was hoping to pay. But in 40 years of collecting, I have never seen these Senate volumes for sale. And that includes going to auctions where the entire focus of the auction was Titanic. So I'm sure there are probably some of these in libraries across the United States as historical documents if you were a federal library depository, but finding these in the open market is virtually impossible. So it's such a new purchase that I don't even have them in my hands yet. Oh, wow. Well, happy reading when they come. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it is wild to look through some of these. And, you know, it's a century ago, 111 years ago, uh, as we approach the anniversary. So people didn't save things back at the time, uh, unlike today. Now, well, now we don't we wouldn't even see these because it would all be online. So it's difficult to find. Like I have the hearings for Andrew Johnson's President Johnson's impeachment, President Nixon's impeachment inquiry, President Clinton's impeachment. I don't have anything from President Trump's impeachment, although I worked on the case as representing some of the whistleblowers, but I haven't seen anything printed because nobody publishes things anymore like that. It's all online. You're not a PDF collector. No, no value in it. It's just (laughs) storage on the computer in the cloud. Not as much fun. So speaking of value, can you talk about the silver half dollar that you collected? Yeah, so collecting with the Titanic, what can you buy since the ship went down, right? And it's on its maiden voyage. So there are very few items that are connected to the ship directly that one survived and two anybody can afford. What I did buy at auction was a silver half dollar that was recovered from the body of a passenger, deceased, named John Gill. I think he was a third-class passenger, as I recall. He was coming over to America to create a new home for his family. His family was still back in England. He didn't survive the sinking, but his body was found as part of the recovery. And whenever anyone's body was found, they sometimes buried them at sea, uh, or they brought them to Halifax, or depending on who the person was, brought them in to be turned over to the family. But more likely than not, especially if they were second, third class passengers, steerage passengers, their pockets would be emptied. And if they could be identified, the belongings would be sent back to the family, not the body. So John Gill was identified and his belongings were all sent back to his family in the United Kingdom. Uh, 90 years later, the family auctioned off a lot of the contents, if not all the contents, uh, through uh, Henry Aldridge, which is an auction house in England that specializes in ships and Titanic in particular, and sold off uh, in large lots, basically his pocket contents. So I didn't buy that. But a decade later in 2012, whoever bought the original lot a decade earlier was selling some of the contents off. So a silver dollar went for auction. And actually, Aldridge wasn't online at that time. Uh, yet yeah, now it is you can just you can bid like on eBay and watch the auction live from England. Uh, but back then you had to either email or phone in or fax or mail in your bids. So I put down this just kind of off the wall bid for myself, not thinking I would get it. And I won it at I think it was like sixty five hundred dollars that I paid for this. 1906, I think it was, uh, half dollar, American silver half dollar. But almost immediately, realizing he had no proof of its authenticity, Mark developed a bit of bitter's remorse. 
and so he decided he could part with it. I put it up for auction. We tried to get it graded uh, for collectors out there of stamps and comic books and baseball cards. You know, there are professional services to grade almost every collectible nowadays. And they wouldn't do it, which actually I was very pleased to learn they wouldn't do it because I kept telling even the auction house, I can't prove the provenance of this coin. So I would be very disappointed if any of the grading companies graded the coin, because if I can't prove it, they can't prove it. Uh, so we auctioned it off raw, I think two years after I bought it in 2014. And I was just hoping to make my money back. It sold for $21,000, which blew my mind. And I watched it live uh, and I was quite ecstatic by it because I thought, wow, that one was actually a worthwhile purchase. Well, like two years later, I get a message from a fellow collector Hey, didn't you own one of those John Gill Titanic coins? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I think it's on Pawn Stars right now. So I ran down the hallway to my television, turned it on, and holy cow, lo and behold, my freaking coin. Now, it's not mine because I sold it, but that was my John Gill coin. It had now been graded, but it wasn't, it didn't uh, substantiate the provenance of it. I think it just said John Gill Titanic coin or thought to be or something. And they graded what the coin graded out as by way of its condition. And I had no idea who the seller was. Uh, turns out, I guess it looks like it was the guy who bought it or someone connected to him who turned out to be a coin dealer, from what I understand. And he wanted $125,000 for it. Uh, Rick brought in an expert who was not a Titanic expert. He was a coin expert. And he clearly had just like Googled the Titanic to come up with the basic fact information pertaining to John Gill as the passenger. He got some facts wrong, but he got some of the basic facts correct that he knew it had sold two years earlier for $21,000. So I think Rick offered him $10,000, which was declined. Uh, <laughs> I have since seen ads for the coin. They were being taken out, and I think in coin magazines, where the guy wanted $74,999.99 for the most expensive Titanic collectible that exists, which is completely not true. There are a lot of coins that were recovered from bodies of Titanic victims, and they exist. Uh, but, you know, trying to show the provenance would be incredibly difficult, other than getting it right from the family of the victim and without a doubt it's not one of the rarest items because that would be either a life jacket a menu or a deck chair those are are the most valuable items from the ship and of course those are actually from the ship but the coin it was a pleasure at least owning it for a little bit in time because it brought me back to the only instance where at least that coin was on the ship when it sank so not that rare, but keeps turning up like a bad penny. Well, apparently, you know, this one, at least this one half dollar keeps showing up. You know, hey, if someone can get 75000 for it, you know, best of luck to you. Good for you. I also want to talk about your movie memorabilia collection. And you've got a lot of things from various movies that portray the disaster. How did you decide to focus on the 1958 film A Night to Remember? And what do you have? So I collect a lot of movie. I'm not a, I wouldn't say I'm a movie prop collector. Uh, but because of the Titanic, uh, there were several major movies. Uh, actually, the Germans made a movie during World War II. And then there was a movie called Titanic in 1953 and Night to Remember in 1958. And these movies had very prominent uh, Hollywood stars at the time. Barbara Stanwyck was in one of them. And it's not particularly difficult to find a movie poster. You know, it could be a few hundred dollars. It's not the end of the world. I found one poster from Titanic in 1953, which... Probably would have been, uh, if it had ever been used, and I doubt this one was, uh, used on the side of a building. Because it's got to be something like seven feet long and probably about two feet wide. The fact that that survived for 60 plus years just blows my mind. And that a dealer found it for me, knowing I collect Titanic memorabilia, was just incredible. But usually you'll find what's called a one sheet, which is 41 inches by 27 inches. It's like if you go to the movies now and you just see a movie poster. Those are standard movie poster sizes. 
or maybe uh, some sort of, you, you can find lobby cards, which I don't even think they're made anymore. Uh, but these would be sort of eight and a half by 11 cards of different scenes from the movies that could be distributed for promotion purposes and hung up at the movie theaters uh, and elsewhere. So Heritage Auctions, which has been a client of mine, actually, uh, auctioned off last summer. They had a lifeboat, a miniature lifeboat from A Night to Remember that was what's called screen used. And I was able to pick that up. Uh, I have a deck chair from the movie Titanic, the modern 1997 version with Leonardo DiCaprio. That's the only chair I've seen because I can't afford, unfortunately, the real deck chairs, if you can even find one from the ship. Uh, but I at least have the deck chair, which uh, I have to say cannot be sit in because if you did, it would, you'd fall right through it. It would break, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering why your collection seems a bit light on the 1997 Titanic. Is there any reason? Yeah. For that? So there's a lot of items that you can get from that. And I, I'm not into the modern stuff. Uh, I mean, the deck chair was cool because I know I'm never going to have a deck chair from the real ship, most likely. But the modern stuff, you know, they create so many items to be movie prop memorabilia for sale. And I actually had a bad taste in my mouth at the time, to be perfectly honest. We were with Titanic International Society, TIS. When I was on the board, we were working with RMS Titanic Inc., which was the entity that was able to gain the rights to the wreckage and go down to try and salvage the items. So the ones, if anybody ever goes to a museum and sees Titanic recovered items, this was from those expeditions. We were providing the historical information to them as part of their expeditions. And when the movie Titanic came out, it was such a surprise to some of us because uh, apparently they were working with Titanic Historical Society for their historical information, not with us. So I had this kind of bad taste in my mouth of, hey, you know, I'm not going to watch your movie. You didn't work with us type thing. So I actually never watched the movie for many, many, many years. I've since watched it. It's a great movie. Music is, you know, great Celine Dion with the soundtrack and everything. But there's just too many modern props from it. You know, I'm more into the historic items. Uh, other than if it's something, you know, so unique that I know I'm never going to be able to get. You know, I probably, if I found a, a menu from the 1997 film, I'd probably buy that because I'm not going to find one from the original ship or probably from the earlier 40s and 50s movies either. Sure. So are there any items you're still looking to acquire? So I am always looking to acquire. And the reality is the Titanic is such a big deal, even post-discovery in 1985, post-movie 1997, they have only increased in interest. So it would be almost impossible to collect everything related to Titanic because of how much has come out in the last almost 40 years since the discovery. So I really try and focus around the ship time of when it was built in 1911, essentially when the keel was laid, the hull was laid, and then from the aftermath of the sinking in the few, whatever few years after, up through more what we'd consider antiques now. So I clearly know there are postcards I do not own because I have bid on ones that I was not able to purchase. I know there are documents and books. Now, you know, thankfully, quite frankly, it's probably in the minority which makes the hunt even that much more enticing in trying to find those items to try and be this sort of completist. And that's why I'm really looking forward to try and doing this book that I'm working on. I'm working with another Titanic collector and actually expert, far more of an expert than I am in the ship itself. Uh, I'm going to be the collector supplying the cards and we're going to work together to pull this whole project into hopefully something publishable within, let's be aggressive and say within two, three years. And as you create this book, you're actually creating another Titanic collectible of sorts. Absolutely. Not only for Titanic postcards, but Titanic books or Titanic overall. Yeah. 
<laughs> so uh, one last question for you. You've gathered all these items and learned so much about the Titanic and the disaster. What would you say is something you've learned about the Titanic or the accident that might be underreported or kind of surprising to people? Hmm. Yeah, great question. So I think what I would say is probably not well known is the content. What was on the ship? Uh, I mean, there's so many books and the real historians and the enthusiasts and let's say the addicts, the Titanic addicts, they can tell you almost everything about almost every passenger that was on board this ship. Because even though there were a lot of steerage passengers, you know, this was the maiden voyage of the largest ship in the world and the most luxurious. So is the cream of the crop. So many wealthy people and politically connected people were on. So lots of great information about all these people. But I still am amazed to read about, you know, sort of what the cargo was and just learning about the lives of the people after they were on the ship and how the sinking impacted them, particularly the survivors. I mean, you know how the sinking impacted those who died, uh, but those who survived, you know, they never were able to really escape from it. And there's a lot you can learn. And in fact, I think one thing, this is a known story, but I bet most people don't know it. The fact that the ship was found in the first place had nothing to do with the search for the Titanic. Uh, it was a search for a sunken Navy submarine that was classified that Bob Ballard got permission to, while he's looking for the submarine, to kind of take a little bit of a detour to try and see if they could find the Titanic. And they just lucked out and on this secret Navy mission found the Titanic. Amazing. Well, Mark, I want to thank you so much for talking about your very thorough efforts to track down all things Titanic. And it's been fun taking a virtual tour through your Titanic size collection. Well, you know, it is an absolute pleasure. And I, I know I can speak for any of my fellow collectors. One of the things that drives so much of us is being able to share it with other collectors and just the public. So, I mean, I, I hope folks can hear the enthusiasm in my voice because it's one thing to have the stolen piece of art that you bought for $10 million that nobody's allowed to ever know you have. That's not what this is about. This is about, I want to share these items because the history to me is just so incredible. And what captivated me as a child, I hope will capture the attention of some other seven-year-old now and get them interested in these types of topics. Yeah, the enthusiasm should be contagious, I imagine. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again, Mark. Anytime. Stay in touch. Very nice to meet you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, short of diving nearly 13,000 feet into the North Atlantic to explore the wreckage himself, Mark Zaid has certainly given himself as close a look as possible to just about all things Titanic. And his quest to acquire even more collectibles appears to be never-ending. So you might say that, when it comes to the Titanic, to paraphrase Celine Dion, his hunt will go on. Sorry, Celine. For Keeps is a production of me, David Peterkovsky. My thanks to Mark Zaid for talking about his impressively wide-ranging collection of memorabilia related to the RMS Titanic. At ForKeepsPodcast.com, you'll see photos of Mark and a variety of pieces from his immense collection. There's also a link to that episode of TV's Pawn Stars, in which Mark's former Titanic half-dollar got appraised, ironically at a price that put it underwater. Go figure. The show's theme song is by Still Flyin', and the closing theme is by Eric Frisch. Additional music for this episode was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening to For Keeps. Until next time, keep on keeping on.